This week's episode is brought to you by Indie Blast Podcast Network, spotlighting the best in independent podcasting. If you are a podcaster looking for a network of other amazing podcasts, look no further than Indie Blast. We offer camaraderie of other podcasters sharing in the hustle of trying to make the best and most professional podcasts we can. By joining Indie Blast, we can help you increase your listenership by offering strength in numbers. It will also increase your chances of monetizing your podcast. As I said, there is strength in numbers, and networks provide that possibility. If you are interested in finding out more about the Indie Blast Podcast Network, go to IndieBlastNetwork.com slash contact. That's IndieBlastNetwork.com slash contact. There are 24 hours in a day. One third of the day is spent in bed. Now, why not be in the most comfortable you can get? Layla mattresses are more than just a foam mattress. They are copper-infused and flippable. That's right, flippable. If you like a harder mattress, use one side. If you like a softer mattress, flip it over and voila. And the great thing about Layla is getting to try it out for 120 nights. That's right, four months. And if you decide that you don't like the mattress, Layla will pick up the cost of shipping it back and give you a full refund. Layla also offers bamboo sheets, weighted blankets, and memory foam pillows. And if you act soon, you can take advantage of their spring sale. $150 off a mattress and two free pillows. That's a $300 value, plus they are offering $30 to $50 off accessories. If you would like to take advantage of this great deal, simply follow the link in the show notes to let them know we sent you and to help support the show. Layla Sleep, thoughtfully designed for the most cool, clean, comfortable sleep imaginable. And welcome to another edition of Everyone Has a Story. I am your host, Nate Wade. We have our special guest this week is Linda Plunkett. She wrote a book called Supernatural Rescue from Broken to Beautiful. It's published by Deep River Books. Uh, in it, she talks about how she was the epitome of mental and physical and spiritual health. And then one day she learned she had a brain tumor. And of course, that kind of threw her life into a tailspin and she had a lot of problems. But the story is full of hope. And I hope you uh, stay tuned to listen to the conversation I had with Linda. It's a great time. So please... Please stay tuned to listen to that. Before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about podcasting, shall we? Hey, have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Or do you have a podcast and maybe you're thinking about switching providers? Well, Buzzsprout is the best company to check out. Buzzsprout is a great competitive place where you can uh, host your podcast and you can, you, they will provide all of the, the, uh, the things that you want from a podcasting platform. They help get your show listed on every major platform. Uh, you can get a great looking podcast website so you don't even have to go outside of Buzzsprout to find a podcast website. They'll create one for you. It's fantastic. Um, and they, you can, or you can have audio players that you can drop into other websites, uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. They, they even have like a, a editing tools. So if you, you know, like uh, those podcasters out there, you know how sometimes the vocals are one vocals louder than the other, and, and it's really kind of obnoxious, and it's really hard to go edit that kind of stuff. Well, Buzzsprout actually offers a program that will help you get rid of that kind of stuff. Also, you can make little sound snippets for advertising. So say you want to advertise your podcast and say, this week on such and such, you can listen to this person or whatever, and you can create like a little 10-second, 20-second spot and to advertise that podcast for that week. It's fantastic. You know, podcasting is not as hard uh, as you think it might be when you've got the right partners and the team at Buzzsprout is definitely the right partners to have. They are passionate about helping you uh, succeed. So, I mean, look, there's already over 100,000 podcasters on the Buzzsprout network. So it's not like they're new. They're one of the first ones that have been around. They've been around for a long time. Plus, if you click on the link in the show notes, uh, Buzzsprout will get you a 20 20- Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid, paid plan. Now remember, Buzzsprout is not sponsoring this, but if you click on that, you help, um, you help. Uh, what am I trying to say, support this show. So please go click on that if you're interested. Uh, find out more in the show notes. That's Buzzsprout, a great place to host your podcast. Now normally in this section, I would be talking about the three things that are making me happy, but I can't think of anything this week. Is that sad? I am very tired. Uh, I work six days this week, probably going to work six days next week. And so consequently, I've made a tough choice where I'm actually going to go on hiatus, another hiatus uh, for e has or everyone has a story. So the month of June, I'm going to be taking off as I get through this harvest time. I work for an agricultural company. And right now, we okay, this is the weird part. I live in Idaho, right? We grow potatoes, right? Well, of course, our seasons are normal seasons, right? You have the fall, you have winter, you have summer and that kind of stuff. So what happens is we plant our potatoes in April, May timeframe. So they're done. They're ready to pick out of the ground in August, September, October. 
So what happens is these days we can push potatoes out We can because we have amazing sellers, potato sellers, that can keep our potatoes fresh for quite a few months. Back in the days, you couldn't keep them fresh for that long. So most of your potatoes were gone by April, May. But now we have potatoes that can push clear out into June. But we need potatoes that will get us through that summer months where Idaho does not have any potatoes. So guess what we're doing as a company? We are actually shipping potatoes up from California and storing them here in Idaho. And I am responsible for making sure those potatoes get put away in the cellar and uh, organized and inventoried because we're actually, we're not just throwing it. Most sellers, what you do in a, mo in a, in a potato cellar is you, you back in your potato truck and you've got this thing called a piler, which is a big belt. And you basically just push those potatoes up the belt and you dump them in a big pile in the cellar. And, and you just fill that cellar up, you close the doors, turn on the air conditioning, and those potatoes will stay good. But we have what we're calling a bin store. So we have all these hundreds and hundreds of wooden crates that hold about 3,000 pounds of potatoes in each one of them. And we stack them in, in aisles and in columns. And so my job is to make sure I inventory each one of them because they're mini, tiny little mini potatoes because that's what we're picking up out of California and bringing them here. And so my job is to inventory those. And because of that, we've got truckers coming and we have trucker hours and you know they show up at all kinds of different times of day. So I work all night long and I also have to work on Saturdays, including Memorial Day. It's sad, I know, it's sad. So because of that, I'm going to have to uh, probably put my podcast on hold, but don't worry, I will be back back with great stories, great interviews, and it's going to be a blast. So please don't uh, don't delete your uh, your subscription to Everyone Has a Story because we're not going anywhere, at least not permanently. Only temporarily will we be putting on a pause. How does that sound? Is that good? All right. <laughs> All right. So that just to throw that out there, but I hope everybody's doing well. Contact me. Say hi. I'd love to hear you say hi. In fact, I've got a phone number. I have a Google phone number and I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Let's see if I can find that really quick. Let's grab my phone and we're going to open up that Google program. And let's see. I don't even remember what it's called. It's probably called Google something, right? Let's see, Google. Oh, still not finding it. Let's see, phone number. Maybe it's a phone. I can't remember. Does anybody know what it's called? Uh, it's not that. Let's see. Nope. 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 Oh, wait. Nope. Uh, crud. I can't remember what it is. I can't find it. I can't find it. That's not fair. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to post that phone number in the show notes. If you want to call and leave me a voicemail telling me if you like the show or if you don't like the show or just to say hi or even ask me a question, I'll play that message on another podcast. What does that sound like? You like that idea? You like to have your voice put on a podcast? Well, then give me a call and let me know what you think of the show. I would love to hear from you and love to hear from my fans. So please don't hesitate to use that phone number. You'll find it in the show notes. Right on? Right on. Well, we've talked enough, so let's get right into it. Right after these messages, we're going to hear the fantastic conversation I had with Linda Plunkett right here on Everyone Has a Story. Do you love a good story? If you do, check out Stories of Your and Yours. I'm Sean Ennis, and each week on Stories of Your and Yours, I narrate a classic short story, adding music and sound effects to bring those stories new life. The back catalog features stories by the likes of Edgar Allan Poe, Kurt Vonnegut, Rudyard Kipling, Mark Twain, Ray Bradbury, and many more. And in addition to classic short stories, I feature original stories by you, the listener. So if you do love a good story, give stories of your, that's Y-O-R-E, and yours, that's Y-O-U-R-S, a listen today. And visit the show at SYY Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to submit your own stories, requests for classic short stories, or just to say hi. That's stories of your and yours, available wherever you get your podcasts. talking to Linda Plunkett today, and we're going to ask her just a few questions about her life and, and uh, things that she's went through. And uh, Linda, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, so first of all, before we get started on talking about some of the things that you called in for today, I just want to talk a little bit about your life and where you're from and where you were raised and those kind of things. So so where, where, where are you from exactly? Well, I was originally raised in a small town in Ohio called Worcester, Ohio. And 
For people that know the Midwest, um, this is in an area of rural Ohio where there's a, a number of Amish people that still drive horse and buggies. Oh, okay. And um, so it was more of a small town, you know, more of a small town where things don't change a lot. And, oh, okay. you know, you don't have a lot of traffic. You don't really have a lot of things going on there, but a, very definitely a small town environment. Mm-hmm. And so how long did you grow up there? Well, I lived there until I left home to go to college when I was 18. I went to college in Michigan. Oh, okay. And then after that time, I pretty much traveled and lived in a lot of different states after that time. But until I was 18, I pretty much had not really been anywhere else but Ohio. Okay. So what did you, what did you attend college for? I basically um, had an elementary education um, degree and a psych soch major on top of that, oh, so, wow. um, which ev- eventually led um, me to become a psychologist. I now have a master's and PhD in psychology, but I started out as a teacher. Oh, okay. Uh, so why did you, uh, you, were you more interested in the psychology aspect of things, or how long did you teach, first of all? I only taught for a couple years. Um, I had met my husband, and so I we started traveling. His job required a lot of travel, and so we began traveling and living in various states around the country. So really only taught for a short period of time. I was really more, probably more interested in psychology, but at that point in time, did not really have the time to to get yeah. the advanced degree, and you really need a master's in psychology to do anything as far as the field. Yeah, right. I, I actually... Um that was one of the many degree or uh, majors I had when I was in college, and that was kind of one of the deciding factors that I got out of it because I wasn't sure I wanted to do a lot more uh, college education after a bachelor's, and I realized that there wasn't much you can do with just a bachelor's in psychology. Right, right, very true. Yeah. So, uh, what? Uh, why did you guys end up settling in Florida then? Well, that's kind of another long story, but after nine years of marriage, uh, unfortunately, it did not work out, and so. Um, at that point, we were living in Ohio after living in several different states around the country, living in New York, Connecticut, Colorado. Um, wow. We got back to Ohio. And um, as you probably know, probably similar to where, where you're, you're in Idaho, I think you said. That's right? correct. Yes. Uh-huh. You have very, very heavy snow in the winter and really just wanted to get out of that climate altogether. So when I had an opportunity to start my new life all over again at that point, I had two young children I just decided I'd much rather be in a warmer climate. Yeah. So came to came to Florida, made a trip to Florida, got a job, made another trip to Florida, found a place to live, and I was on my way and pretty much have lived in Florida ever since. And so how long has that been then? Okay, that <laughs> wow. That's that's been a lot of years. I have to kind of look back and think about that. Yeah. Um since that would be since the mid '80s. Oh, okay. So yeah, so you're you're at this point pretty much a Floridian, aren't you? Exactly. Yes, <laughs> um, you could definitely call me a Floridian. Would you ever want to move out of the state? Well, I've lived in Orlando originally. I moved to Orlando uh-huh. and then um, ended up um, moving to Jacksonville when I remarried. My okay. husband and I have been now married over thirty years. Oh, great. And now we're on the West Coast. But no, I I enjoy Florida. Florida has a lot to offer. Uh huh. Um, I do I do like Asheville, North Carolina, and we get it to Asheville fairly frequently. But other than Asheville, I'm, I'm pretty happy with Florida. Okay, good. Yeah. I, like I said, I've been down to Florida one time, and uh, it was it was an amazing experience for somebody who's been in the Rocky Mountain Northwest his entire life. And just, just to see, you know, just how green it is and honestly how flat it was, I was pretty amazed. But to see all of the uh, the alligators and, and all those kind of things was just a, a just an eye-opening experience even small little things like i remember being in my hotel and around here we have spiders that catch bugs and down there there was all these little geckos or whatever they were all over the place on the hotel i was like this is weird <laughs> it was yeah, very strange little, little lizards they, yeah. my cat i have a 16 year old cat she loves to catch those lizards. oh yeah yeah <laughs> And then another thing that's kind of weird for me here in Idaho is that right outside of my hotel room uh, was this farm. There was like a bunch of cows there, which is great. I understand it's a rural area and that kind of stuff. But they're sitting under a palm tree. And to me, that just kind of fried my brain because you don't see cows sitting under a palm tree in Idaho. It's just it just doesn't seem right for some reason. I don't know what it was. And the other thing, 
thing. The other thing you talked about, the geckos or the lizard, mm-hmm. it's not unusual to see an alligator. This past week I was playing golf, and there was a three-foot alligator on the court. He was trying to catch a bird, like one of those water birds. Right. That is, that's just weird to me. I, I can't even I, – I don't even know. I mean yeah. – Anyways, I'll just stay in Idaho. I mean, I, I, you know, you talked about the cold winters, and I totally understand. And there, you know, my wife and I sometimes maybe want to live, uh, you know, move away here. But um, there are times where I, I, I question why I live in this cold state, and then I see, you know, some of these snakes and alligators and things like that. And I'm thinking, okay, now I remember why I live here because we don't have that kind of stuff, and it, I kind of like it that way. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, yeah, let's, and honestly, yeah. they're not much of a threat to people. Sure, you know, they're kind of sure. like, well, like with the bears, if you don't see the bears, they the alligators. Right, right, exactly, for sure. So let's talk a uh, little bit about um, uh, your 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 health problems that you've had. Um, now, you had a, a tumor that was found um, in your, uh, like, on your brain. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. It was very bizarre because I basically was very hacked active, healthy, probably healthier than someone my age on an average, very active, play golf, do some ballroom dancing, even do some competitions in ballroom dancing, but very active, very healthy, um, no high blood pressure, no anything as far as health concerns. Sure. And then one day a doctor tells me that I have a tennis ball sized tumor in my brain that's going to require immediate surgery. So it was kind of like shock. Shock in disbelief mode. Well, what led them to look for it to begin with? Well, it was interesting because I hadn't really noticed anything. You know, people say, oh, did you have a headache? You know, were you feeling something? I really didn't have a headache. I didn't feel anything. But I had a couple friends. Well, actually, my son and a friend who's a missionary to Guatemala, they came to town, and we were all having lunch together. Mm-hmm. And came back from lunch, and they were talking to my husband, saying, you need to have her checked out. There's something not right. And hmm. he said, what do you mean? She's fine. There's nothing wrong with her. But anyway, and long story short, went to the doctor, and the doctor said the same thing. Probably nothing. Don't worry about it. But then when the MRI came back, uh, they found this massive tumor on my brain that was going to require immediate surgery. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, what kind of emotions were you dealing with when that when you when you heard the doctor uh, give that diagnosis? Well, you know, in, in disbelief, and I always laugh, and I tell people I probably would have been in denial. But when you're a psychologist, you can't be in denial. <laughs> like this isn't happening. Sure. Yeah, that's what you would like to believe it isn't happening. Maybe it's a bad dream. Maybe I'll wake up and it'll be gone. But obviously, that was not the case. And the other part of it was because the strange behavior was a form of a, a, actually a form of a a seizure, the doctor said. Mm -hmm. A seizure can kill you quicker than a brain tumor, and Mm -hmm. so I had to have the surgery as soon as possible. So how long was it between the time you were diagnosed and the time you ended up having the surgery? Well, I was diagnosed the very end of October, and I had the surgery in early December. So finding, you know, finding a brain surgeon is kind of a strange experience. Um, when you start talking to people. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, we found someone who actually had done brain surgeries and he hadn't lost anybody yet. So I figured he was a good gamble. That's probably a good bet, yeah, (laughs) statistically. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, so then um, you had had about a month and a half, though. I mean, was it hard to, to just, you know, I guess wrap your mind around what was going on in this whole situation, though? Well, it was, and when you start interviewing brain surgeons, and a lot of them, it, it's, everything they tell you is very theoretical. Like, for example, we, we met this, with this doctor at this really renowned medical clinic, and he said, oh, some of these tumors you can pull through the nose, and I'm looking at my husband because my tumor was the size of a tennis ball, and I'm yeah. thinking, well, my face would certainly be disfigured if you pulled it through my nose, you know, <laughs> but I'm thinking, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, so... Yeah. When you talk to people that are supposed to be renowned experts and then they don't seem to have a clue, um, it makes you wonder. You know, you start wondering, like, what is going to be the outcome? And and am I even going to make it through this? You know, that's the other part of it. You know, chances of, um, you know, of making it through a brain surgery. Plus, I had complications and my surgery was twice as long as predicted. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how long was it? I was just going to ask you that, actually. Well, the original surgery was supposed to be three to four hours. It, te- it ended up being almost an eight-hour surgery. Oh, wow. wow. Uh, it, it, why, it, just because of the complications that, that happened in it? 
because of the complications at that point, and you know, the technology is different. That was back in 2012. The technology is probably different, but they could not tell if it was, say, a, a soft tumor or a hard tumor. A soft brain tumor, they could pop out with an ultrasound, but because mine was a hard tumor, it, he basically the surgeon broke three different knives trying to cut it out. Oh my goodness. And then when he, he, he tried to restitch the, the, like the lining, they had to cut my head open from ear to ear. Uh-huh. And we, when he started to restitch the lining, which is the dura, it's called the dura to uh-huh. the brain, basically the dura broke and he had to start all over and restitch all over again. Wow. Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> but everything, um, were they able to remove the, the whole tumor? They did remove it. Um, it was not a good scenario for me when I woke up because I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk well. I couldn't think well. Um, basically, I felt on a spiritual side that God had abandoned me. I had three years of memory. And I didn't have an ability to smell or to taste right after the surgery. So oh, wow. it was pretty, pretty devastating to wake up from that and then have a throbbing head and um, ice packs on your head. And, you know, every time I would try to stand, I would fall. Yeah. It was pretty devastating. So how long did it take to recover from that surgery then? Well, it was not it was not a good thing. Um, ten days after the surgery, I really had I had a near death experience, and I really felt I was dying. Literally, I felt my spirit was leaving my body. And um, but you know, I, at that point, I had a, a supernatural experience. That my book with Supernatural Rescue is is partially named after that experience when I literally felt the power of God pull me back into my body when I was dying. But it took several months to learn how to walk, and honestly, about six, seven I felt, even though a major clinic said, we can't help you, I was really, really messed up, I felt I was starting to make some improvement. I couldn't go back to work or anything, but I was walking, and I was thinking a little better, and, you know, things were going a little better, and then one day I wake up, and I have pain all over my body, and I can't sleep anymore, and so then that next phase was actually worse than recovering from the brain surgery. Wow, which uh, which was what exactly? I mean, did you? you uh, well, nobody exactly knew. Yeah, they labeled it as fibromyalgia, and uh-huh. they said it was from the trauma of the brain surgery. But I had certain doctors that said, "Oh, we don't believe in fibromyalgia. We'll find out it's something else." But nobody really found out that you know it was anything else. And actually, fibromy- fibromyalgia comes from um, the nerves, which the nerves are connected to the brain, so it kind of makes sense. But that was really um, horrible. I stopped sleeping. I had pain all over my body. Or if I was lucky, I got a couple hours of sleep a night. But I felt that really changed me in a negative way because I, I couldn't sleep. I had pain, and it really changed me into another person. Mm. And I really started to hate myself. And I've never had self before. But it was a bad experience. You know, just feeling like you really you didn't want to live anymore. Yeah. So did you end up, did you struggle with uh, some depression and stuff like that because of all of these situations? Oh, yeah, no doubt. When you don't sleep, I'll tell you, when you don't sleep and you have pain, and um, I was actually, I went up to Ohio to care for my father, who was 98 years old. There wasn't a lot I could do, but I could care for him and help him hire a caregiver up there. You know, I could do some things for him, and um, I basically um, had a really bad electrical shock, and I went out in the garage, and I just had a meltdown, and I said, God, why didn't you let me die? Why didn't you let me die when I had the brain surgery? Because life had just become so bad in that night. Mm -hmm. Um, I had another miracle. I had an angel come to my bedroom. Okay. I may have lost. Are you there? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. You had an angel come to your bedroom, and what what happened with that? Um, what was that well, experience? I thought I was asleep. You know, this is after I said I got very angry and cried out to God, and you know, I didn't really expect a response. But um, I went to bed, and I I woke up, and there's this bright light coming through the ceiling, and I you know, I'm basically thinking this is a dream, and I'm you know slapping my face, and no, you're awake, this isn't a dream, but it was a very bright light, and there was a figure on the other side, and although the figure didn't say anything, I really felt that it was an angel that was sent to me to give me hope that things would get better in the future. Okay, 
So how did you respond after that, um, you know, that experience with the angel? Did you, was your, um, did you have more hope? Did you have more faith? Um, did, oh, yeah. Did you yeah, improve? I would say so. And also, you know, I've had a lot of anger towards God. And, um, you know, in the past, I might have said to people, and I'm more of a spiritual type counselor, um, I might have said to people, oh, you shouldn't be angry. But honest, I think, honestly, I think the anger was good because I was honest and God knew my heart and how thought things would get better. And very gradually, they did get better. Mm-hmm. Gradually, though, that was kind of the, the thing, though, huh? Well, yeah, I went, I got a medication initially worked, and then after spending almost $600 a month on the medication, the medication stopped working, so it kind of put me back, you know, to where I was before, but I probably suffered from fibromyalgia a total of a couple of years, oh, and wow. um, I tried to get back to my life, though. So, I mean, I, I did open my practice again, thankfully. I competed in ballroom dancing, but I had a couple physical injuries, one to my hip and one to my knee, and I got stem cells for the injury, and basically it cured 90% of my fibro. Oh, wow. That's great. Uh, probably one of the biggest, really, miracles, yeah. Was not expected, and nobody told me that there was any chance of that happening, but I immediately started to sleep better. And <laughs> so the, the great thing about the stem cells, when you get an IV, they travel around your body, and they go where they're needed. And mm-hmm. I guess my brain needed them, and that's so they went to my brain. And <laughs> along with uh, curing the injuries, um, sure. I became a lot healthier. Oh, good. So here we are, eight years um, out from your surgery. That's correct? You had it in 2012? Is that what you said? Yeah. 2012, right? Okay. Probably finally recovered around 2014, 2015. Oh, okay. So do you have any other lasting effects from the surgery, or is pretty much everything um, cleared up? Still can't smell. My sense of smell is gone. Um, you know, I have some memory issues, but I'll tell you, for people my age, I see other people out there in the world that have more. I think public figures that I know have more memory issues than I do, so I really shouldn't complain. <laughs> but... Um, Honestly, um, you know, I'm very blessed to be where I am. I mean, I'm winning dance competitions. Dreamed at the highest level of dancing. Um, I, I speak publicly. I do inspirational speaking and teaching. I'm working on a, a coaching course. While I've closed my counseling practice, um, I've written the one book, and I will probably try to write at least one more book. But right now I'm working on an online program to help people that are busy with various issues. Oh, great. That sounds awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about your dancing. Uh, You've done competitive ballroom dancing. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, you said you've competed at the highest levels on that. Tell me just a little bit about it. You know, and it's it's interesting. It really does depend a lot on the instructor you have. A couple years ago, I had an instructor, and I wanted to compete at a certain level. He said, no, you can't do that. You're not good enough. Well, I got a new instructor, and then I started winning competitions, which is very exciting. Yeah, and moved up. I've moved up two levels, so now I'm at, I'm dancing at gold and doing better than what I ever dreamed that I could do, considering you know what I've been through with my past. Sure. But you know, the good thing about people don't understand this, and probably the next book I write will be about the brain, because when a ma- when a major medical medical institution said to me, "There's nothing we can do for you. You know, your brain's fried. Just accept it." I said, I can't live like this. I have to get better. And one way you get better or improve your brain is to learn new things. And the yeah. more new lo- things you can learn, the more you can educate yourself. It helps your brain, and it will help your brain become stronger and less likely to have dementia or Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. And so uh, ballroom dancing was one of the things you decided to do. And, and not only did that help with you know stimulating your brain, but y- your body as well. I mean, it was a full impact sport, basically. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Well, and I lacked balance. And, you know, when you said about side effects, I sometimes have a little trouble with balance. Um, mm-hmm. But when you have a very large tumor and they take it out of your head, it, it plays havoc with your brain because you have sure. a hole in your head. Yeah. It has to rewire itself. But, yeah, as I as I force myself to dance and do triple spins and things like that, mm-hmm. I'm always working on balance. So, yeah. Um, you know, if I had just accepted the diagnosis of the the, the of the first medical institution that evaluated me, I who knows, I could be in a wheelchair. Right. I might not even be walking right now. But, you know, what I would tell people is sometimes you just have to not accept no. You can't believe everything you hear, and you've got to find your own information. Yeah. 
And from that information, you'll find that, you know, unfortunately, doctors aren't always right. The information they give you, they mean well, but they're limited by their own education and training as well. Right. Yeah, that's true. And it's always good to get a second opinion or a third or fourth or fifth, you know, depending on how far you want to take it. It's, it's definitely good to get those opinions. And I'll tell you, uh, the ballroom dancing, right. it, uh, you know, the stuff you're doing is, is far beyond anything I've ever done. I've only danced <laughs> once. I, I got, uh, I guess you could say, suckered into doing um, dancing with the Idaho Falls Stars or whatever it was around here. It was basically oh, how exciting. Yeah, it how was exciting. A, yeah, it was a fundraiser for the, the, can, the American Cancer Society. And so they, um, I had to raise money and that kind of stuff. But I, um, I got paired with this lovely um, girl who was a great ballroom dancer and – it was only, gosh, maybe a 25-second or 30-second routine, and we spent hours on that, and I was terrible. And this lady made me – this girl made me look like uh, just an amazing dancer, and she was the one that was the professional. But it was hard. Well, that, it was very hard. If you have a great instructor, they know how to do that. Yeah, they really do. It is. And I'm telling you, it was hard. 25 seconds, and so what you do and the level you're competing at, I, I am, I'm, a mess, I'm, I'm impressed. That is just amazing to me. So let's talk a little bit about your, your decision to write a book. What was it that said, hey, I want to write a book about these experiences that I've went through? Well, I'll tell you, and I was having a real huge struggle with memory, you know, right after the brain, the brain tumor happened and the recovery. I'll tell you, I got some good advice from a home health care nurse because I was talking about depression. I was extremely depressed and I cried a lot mm-hmm. the first 30 days, and it was a different kind of depression. It not, wasn't a normal kind of depression, but what the home health care nurse said is, is create a journal and write things down. I know you don't understand that right now, but the things you write down will help you later to show your progress. So I began this journal, and in the beginning, I couldn't even read my own handwriting. That's how messed up I was. Oh, wow. But I, started, I kept writing, and I kept writing, and the book Supernatural Rescue and the early days, because like I said, the, it, it did a number on my memory. Having I felt like I lost three years of memory immediately. I couldn't remember things like my son's wedding, um, you know, things that I had just done the year before or even the past few years before. So writing things down really did help, and it became the basis then for the book. Mm. And so how long has that book been out? That book came out in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um it was available at Barnes and Noble and also Amazon. I think there might still be some Amazon copies. I want to relaunch the book um, in my own, through my own self-publishing efforts, and I've been working on that, but that has not happened yet. Okay. But um, there are copies available. What I always tell people, if you want a copy, you can go to my website, lindasplunkett.com, send me a message. I'm happy to – I will mail you a book. I've mailed them all over the country and even all over the world. Um, my speaking engagements, I always have books with me, copies to give people. Um, so I did get a publisher, and people say it's hard to get a publisher. I went to a, a writing conference. It was a Christian writers conference in um, Michigan, mm-hmm. and I had a publisher pursue me for the book. So oh, I didn't wow. have to really look for a publisher. But I do, I will tell you, there's also great advantages to self publishing. So anybody who's thinking about writing, or publishing, I would say check that out as well. Sure. Awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for, for talking with us today. And we will make sure we put uh, any information you want to give us as far as how to get a hold of you and how to how to get one of your books uh, in the show notes so people can get a hold of you, okay? I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Linda. It's been a blessing talking to you. You're a great inspirational story, and uh, I, I wish you the best in the future. Well, thank you. I wish you the best as well. Linda Plunkett on Everyone Has a Story. Thank you so much, Linda, for calling into the dungeon and sharing a little bit about your journey with us. Fantastic conversation, and we truly appreciate you taking time out of your day to do that. If you folks want to find out a little bit more about Linda Plunkett, you can find out more about her book and get in touch with her and her social media. Uh, You can find all of those notes in the show notes section, so please don't hesitate to do so. I know she would love to hear from uh, each and every one of you that are interested in, in talking to her and finding out a little bit more about her. Her. I do want to talk just a little bit before I get off the air here about something. One of the persons that really inspired me to get into podcasting was a man by the name of Mark Marin. He's a comedian. Perhaps some of you know him. He's had his own show. Uh, he also stars in Glow on Netflix, <clears throat> the gorgeous women of our gorgeous ladies of wrestling. 
Um, but he was the one that kind of inspired, inspired me to get into um, podcasting and especially interview format type podcasting. And this morning I found out that his girlfriend that he's been dating for about a year uh, suddenly passed away on Friday. And I just want to send my condolences out to Mark Marin and everybody who knew um, Lynn Shelton and uh, her family um, as well. Uh, it was kind of a sad and, uh, thing to hear. And so, Mark, I hope you're doing okay. And I know you'll probably never hear this, but if you do, I want you to know that thank you so much for inspiring me to become a podcaster. And I truly do love your show. And um, you have meant a lot to me over the years. Thank you so much. I hope you guys in, uh, look forward to joining me next week because I will be back for one more week before my uh, self-quarantine, should I call that? It's a self-podcasting quarantine. I don't, okay, that's kind of dumb. That's all I'm going to say. All right, this is Nate Wade saying, I hope you have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Um, you know, practice your social distancing. And remember, everyone is unique. Everyone has a story. What's yours? Bye-bye, y'all. Podcast Network.